Good evening, my darling listeners. I'm Ali Silva. We're coming to you. Ah. Thank you. We are coming to you live from this most lovely and distinguished venue, the Slipper Room. Right in the heart of Manhattan's Lower East Side. Now, although we perform this show in the Big Apple, my dearest audience, this evening, we are about to take a trip together deep, deep down into the American South, a South with a culture caught somewhere between its romanticized past and its more complicated present and future. Yes, yes, y'all, I'm referring to our homage to a genre known as Southern Gothic. Tonight, we are here to serve you three corrosive courses, battered and fried up just right so it will stick to your ribs and may never come off. (laughs) Who are the prime practitioners of this most esteemed genre? Carson McCullers? William Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, and one of my all-time favorites, Tennessee Williams. Tennessee Williams, whose étouffée suddenly last summer includes a number of ingredients such as the theme of predation. to where my cousin Sebastian had disappeared in the flock of featherless little black sparrows. He, he was lying naked as they had been naked against a white wall. And, and this you won't believe. Nobody has believed it. Nobody, nobody on earth could possibly believe it. And I don't blame them. They had devoured parts of him. Torn or cut parts of him away with their hands or or knives or maybe those jagged tin cans they made music with. They had torn bits of him away and stuffed them into those goblin, fierce, little empty black mouths of theirs. There wasn't a sound anymore. There was no, nothing to see but Sebastian. What was left of him? That looked like a big white paper wrap bunch of roses had been torn, thrown, crushed against that blazing white wall. Oh, but I digress. (laughs) We do have horrors of our very own making to unearth. Our first original story revolves around a very particular passion that runs deep in Southern culture. Auto racing. <laughs> we call this Formula One fear fest too much pressure. Y'all on the ready? Clem! Buck, Harry, tires, gotta change them. Ready, Clem? Quickly now. Rolling them over. Hurry. Come on, you lazy sacks of Pikmin. Oh, hurry, hurry. You'll be out of here in a minute, Mac. We don't have a minute. You guys better not cause me another race as we're finished. 45 seconds, Clem. Let's go, crew. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Refueling. Harry, get the driver's side. Standard. Looking oh. good, looking good. Such a bitch is the tires, the tires. Just about ready, Mac. Just about ready. I need him now. All clear! Clear! (laughs) Land sakes! What a son of a bitch! Give me one of them cigarettes, Buck. Sure, but all I got are these little cheap things. Honey, have one of mine. Deidre! Beth Ann, what in the hell are you doing here? Only the pit crew allowed over here. This place is dangerous. We just love the excitement. You boys have just the best seat in the house. Deirdre, get your rear back in the stands before I belt you. And Beth Ann, what is wrong with you? You know better. Wrong with me. Nothing wrong with me, sugar. And where 
did all your clothes go? Why is my wife strutting around here with a skirt as short as... We were just trying to come over and be nice and social, but if you're Get gonna... back where you belong now. Oh, it's my fault. I'm sorry. We're going. We're going. Don't sass me, woman. Oh, yeah, well, why do... What did you say? Winning in today's race would put him in more of a winning mood. I mean, you'd think he'd show more... <sighs> what, what, is, what does it matter? Well, what does it take to lighten a fella's mood? I mean, how many more cups and trophies does it take? I mean, where do you go from here? What do I care? What do you care? Well, you're one of the best crew chiefs out there today. Mac ought to show more appreciation is all for you, me, us. The whole team was put him where he's at today. Why? What do you mean, why? Because we're the best, that's why. No, Buck, wh- why? Why was Beth Ann wearing that itty bitty excuse for a skirt out on the track today? Oh, She's putting on a show. For I who? Guess. For you, good buddy. For me? Come on now, you can't be that touched in the head, Buck. Well, I, I do see your point. I mean, if Deirdre is out there on the track wearing anything above the knees, <laughs> I'd right reset her jaw. I can be sure of that. Well, speak of the devil. Look who just walked in here, big boss man. Maybe he's going to buy us a drink to celebrate. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, oh, boy. What? Uh, easy, Clam. What the hell? Uh, easy, hoss, easy. Why is she with him? Hey, fellas. Good job out there today. Buck, I need a moment alone with Clem. Sure thing, boss. Mind if we sit down here in this booth with you? You're kidding me. You you gotta be kidding me. We just thought it'd be proper, you know, to talk face to face. This can't be happening. I, I was hoping this was all in my head. We're not here to talk about what's in your head. We're here to talk about what's in our hearts. This is a joke, right? Mac and I are in love. And we. This is ridiculous! And we want to be together. We're telling this straight to your face. We're not sneaking around behind your back anymore, that is. Jesus Christ. Like everything else in this world, Mac. Big shot race driver, you just take what you want, like picking peaches off a tree. Simple as that, huh? Glad to see that you picked yourself a real ripe one, yes, sir. I'm I'm real sorry, honey. Not as sorry as you're gonna be. Are you threatening her, Clam? You get your hand off my arm right now. You have a right to be angry, Clam, but this isn't easy for me, you know. Easy for you. (laughs) <laughs> Let's face the facts, Clem. You and I have not been happy for a long time. Not since you came back from the war. Our marriage hasn't been the same after that. You, you were a different person. You were so warm and so loving. And now it's like you're not here on Earth anymore. You live someplace else, it seems. And it's someplace where I don't exist. Is that so? Really? That look, Clem, please, just, please stop looking at me like that. If you don't make you feel better, old man, you can take, have a good swing at me. I'll give you that. I can admit I deserve that. Okay, then, I was trying to do the gentlemanly thing. How about pistols at dawn, Buck? Oh, you're kidding. This is also hard for me to do, but given the present situation, I think we're going to have to part ways professionally, too. I'll... I'll give it to Wednesday to clear your things from the garage in the office. <laughs> I am sorry, honey. I, I, I really am. <laughs> Tell you what, Beth Ann. You have until Wednesday to get all your things out of my house or I throw everything that you own 
or anything that even reminds me of you into the trash where it really belongs. Uh, okay. Come on, Beth Ann, we should go. Yes. <laughs> yes, you should. Clam? Was, it, was that what I just saw yes. there? Was Mac and Beth Ann? Yep. Seriously? Oh, uh, and how are you going to be our crew chief with, 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 with all the nonsense going on? Oh, Jesus. Yep, I'm sorry, Hoss. Everyone is sorry. Clem, I, 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 I don't like that look in your eye, buddy. That's the stare. Look, Clem, the, the war really messed both of us up. I mean, we, we saw a lot of things we didn't want to see, but believe me, buddy, good old buddy of mine, please do not do what I think you're thinking of doing. Please. What else do I have now? A truckload of bitter memories? Nightmares that wait for me each evening when I go to bed? No. No, there's, there's nothing left for me now. Now, now, you just hold it right there, buddy. You still got me. You know that, right? I, I know you're in a lot of pain right now, but, but, but me and Deirdre, uh, we're going to be checking in on you. And, and you call me up anytime, and, and I'll come running. You, you got that, Sport? You don't have to worry about me. I don't feel nothing. One more cup of coffee for the road. You sure you're ready to go back to your house right now? That boy is steaming hot. He may do something rash. I worry. I know my husband. I've got to try. You think he's going to take you back? I don't know. But I just got to try. Trust me. It's never the same once infidelity, re infidelity rears its ugly head. Trust me. I mean, when I got when I caught Buck fooling around with Betty, my beautician. Oh yes, I I remember. I mean, we eventually made up and got through it on all things, but haven't been the same after that. You see, I mean, I can't even get my hair done there anymore. Mm, I know. And believe me, there was no one better than Betty. <laughs> it was a mistake with Mac. Oh, a huge mistake. I was such a fool. A stupid little fool. I cost Clem his job. I cost him me, us, everything. I, I don't blame him if he won't take me back, but I've got to try. I'm driving up back up to Topolonga Terrace tonight. Wish me luck, girl. Well, God bless your heart, honey. I'll pray for the both of you. I know he needs me. More than ever. That's what I couldn't see before. Clem? Honey? I'm here, Clem. Clem? Oh, it's so dark in here. All the shades pulled down. Let me, let me just pull one up. Oh, that's a little better. Clem, are you home? Well, that sounded like it came from the garage. He must be in there. Let me pull up another shade so I can find that door to the garage. It's so dang dark in here. Oh, there. Now I can see it. Clem? You in there, honey? Clem? Yeah? Uh, what are you doing there in the dark? Turn the light on, then. Uh, okay. Hey, sweetheart. No, no, no. Don't, don't shoot. I, Sorry, I, I, sweetheart. That was just a tranquilizer gun, honey. <laughs> but those were no ordinary tranquilizer darts. I uh, put a little something of my own in there, a family recipe of sorts. You remember I told you about my great 
Grandma, my old mima, Sadie, she was almost full Cherokee, she was. Good lady. Fine old lady, she was. See, when I was a little boy and she told me about all them old Cherokee ways, see, there was this poison that they used in them, uh, them blowguns they had back in the old days. Well, they, they'd make them blowguns from river cane and use them for hunting and then paddle, too. They'd see a rabbit running past, aim that long blowgun, and <laughs> rabbit for supper. But they used different kinds of poisons in the darts. There were some poisons they would use when they wanted to kill a creature or a human being, depending on the situation, of course. And there were other kinds of poisons as well, like the one that's coursing through your veins right now, my love. Please, please don't waste your breath, dear. (laughs) The poison won't kill you, but you will be paralyzed for a few hours. That's more than enough time than I need for you. You won't lose consciousness, though. No, no. The the poison won't kill you. Here, let me pick you up, old girl. Uh, (laughs) You're you're a little heavy for such a little thing. (laughs) I'm just teasing. You're as light as a feather. Light as the day I carried you across the threshold into this house. You remember that day, don't you? Them good old days? Oh, let's lay you down, right? Here. <laughs> right here by the car. By the front tire. Let's put that little sleepy head of yours right by the front tire. Just like so. Oh, oh, easy now, easy now. Don't, don't try to move. Because you won't be able to. Now... You know how I get to be the best crew chief in the business? Do you? I tell you, one word, tires. If it's one thing I know, it's tires. Every kind of tread, bead, sidewall, or groove, I've seen them all. I know them inside and out. Did you know the word tire comes from the French tire, I believe? (laughs) Apparently, that's the French word for pull. I learned that when I was over in France during the war. But I'm proud to say it was my other ancestors, the Scots, that perfected the modern tire we use today. But if it's one thing I know about tires, it's that you never want to over-inflate one. It's a very, very dangerous thing to do. You never want to over-inflate. You know, if a body is standing next to a tire that... um. There we go, like the way you are right now, with your head against the front tire of this car, right here. And you let the tire, and you let, and you let the tire over and plate, boom! You'll be blown to itty bitty pieces. Even tinier than that short skirt you wore for our good friend Mac. Yes, ma'am. They won't find much of you. Your head will be gone. That much I know. They won't find the poison in your body, neither. That's almost impossible to trace. Especially if you're scattered about in tiny pieces. Yeah. I can make this look like an accident if I want to. Haven't quite figured that part out yet. Truth is, I don't really care. I'm already dead myself. Been half dead ever since I came back from the war. And now, my dear, you have killed what was left of me. I should thank you, I suppose. Look at that tire. It's really getting quite bloated there. How much longer till she pops? Not much longer, I reckon. Clem! Clem, what the hell are you doing? Stay away, Buck. This is between me and her. crazy son of a bitch. You're going to kill her. I said, get away. Bud, get away from that tire. Get, get, get the... Bud! Who? Bud, Stop no! It. Don't get up. Buck! Buck, oh no, Buck, why? Why, why did you throw yourself in front of her? No! 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 <laughs> No! No! 
word from one of our sponsors. And why are we walking down this dark old alley in the middle of the night? Because it's the shortest way home. <laughs> and because we've all <laughs> had a little too much to drink. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm a fearsome attacker. I've been sitting here all night behind this garbage can all night waiting for the unsuspecting female type victims to bounce upon. Good, you're still here. Roar! <laughs> Ooh, hey, ladies, has this ever been you? Well, the last thing you want to be is here, caught right in here, this situation right here. Here you go, ladies, catch. Wow! John Paul Jean's cayenne pepper spray. Take that, creep! Hey, I'm blinded! I'm blinded, man! Is that spicy on the eyes? I'm ready to harmless to these damsels. Foiled again! I must flee! Look at him! He's on the run! <laughs> <Hoo-wee>. <laughs> That's right, ladies. Make sure to use old Jean Paul Jean's cayenne pepper spray on your next attack. Spice up his night by applying directly to his face. Wait two seconds and watch him get blinded with that authentic Cajun flavor. Ooh-wee. And don't forget, ladies, my cayenne pepper spray can be enjoyed not just during a late night attack. It's also great for a late night snack. <laughs> spray it right on your favorite meat, fish, or poultry. And whoo-wee, and now it's a part of your sin, Didi. Get blinded by the flavor. Feels so good right now, I'm going to spray it right on my own face. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, damn good man, that's about it. I'll tear it right here for you, folks. Jean Paul Jean's authentic cayenne pepper spray. Blind them with flavor. Hooey! Oh and now we'd like to present for you lovely murder ballad performed to ghoulish perfection by Ms. Allison Gwynn and Ms. Martina Da Silva. It's called The Knoxville Girl.
My mother, she was worried and woke up with a fright, saying, dear son, what have you done to bloody your clothes so? I told my anxious mother I was bleeding at my nose. I called for me a candle to light myself to bed. I called for me a handkerchief to bind my aching head. Rolled and tumbled the whole night through as troubles was for me. Like flames of hell around my bed and in my eyes could see. They carried me down to Knoxville and put me in a cell. My friends all tried to get me out, but none could go my mail. I'm here to waste my life away down in this dirty old jail. Because I murdered that Knoxville girl, the girl I love so well. And that, my friends, it concludes Act One of our program. So now would be a good time to visit the wonderful bartenders, Annabelle and Nick, and perhaps find yourself a delicious beverage. And judging what by what we I know we have in store for you in Act Two, you might want to make them or ask them to make it a particularly strong one. So please meet us back here in ten minutes. All right, y'all. All right. See y'all in a little bit. Everybody good? Y'all all right? Did y'all know that in some Native American dialects, the name Kentucky means dark and bloody ground? Well, y'all may not know that I am a native of that dark and bloody ground. A state that's known for the Kentucky Wildcats, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and the Kentucky Derby, as well as the Great Bourbon Trail. Who are the bourbon drinkers here? Anybody? All right. Bourbon men, let yourselves be heard. Okay, bourbon women, let yourselves be heard. That's my girls. That's my girls. Uh, So I have my own uh, little glass here with me, and I must say that our lovely bar staff here at the Slipper Room, Annabelle and Nick, oh, they do know how to pour a good one. (laughs) So let's hear it for them, folks. Now, as anyone who knows anything about bourbon knows that not all, but the best bourbon is made in the great state of Kentucky. The oldest label being Woodford Reserve, which can trace its roots all the way back to 1797. Yeah. And Jim Beam, Maker's Mark, Buffalo Trace, Knob Creek. There are other fine examples of loved the world over. But So let's just raise our glasses to the good state of dark and bloody ground, Kentucky. Regardless of the beverage of your choice, home of bluegrass, barbecue, burgoo. Stay with us now, sugars. I think things are about to get a little extra crispy. Our next story is a collaboration between Mr. Blake Gilson and Mr. Silben Sandivar. Written especially 
for the Mystery Theater. It's called R.W. Holdenstead was that peculiar type of person who in all her life never came in first place. She came in third at the Beulah Benz beauty pageant in 1933 when she was 16. She took home the silver medal at the local high diving contest. And her entry in the big key lime pie bake off at the state fair only earned her honorable mention. Only once did she take home top honors, the grand prize, but it came at a considerable cost. Are you ready, couples? Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the 22nd hour of the competition. Music, please, maestro. In 1936, Jeannie and her brother Wesley were dance partners in the Great Dance Marathon held in Beulah Bands. These kinds of contests were popular in poor areas all over the country during the Great Depression. Jeannie and Wesley were one of six couples still standing. The many others had passed out, fainted from exhaustion. Come on, Wesley. Come on, we're gonna win that fifteen hundred dollars. We're we're outlasting them all. I I, I I don't think I can. Don't, don't say anything, Wesley. Save your breath. We're gonna win this time. Oh, we're gonna win. Come on. Yes. After twenty-two hours of dancing, they were all half dead. <laughs> you couldn't even call it dancing anymore. One couple fell to the floor, then another, and another. The last two couples struggled to stay on their feet, pathetic in their phantom-like embraces. The crowd roared as the second-to-last couple crashed to the ground like an open sack of potatoes. And for the first and last time in her life, Jeannie came in first. And the winners of the big cash money prize of $1,500 is... Jeannie and Wesley Ramsey! Wesley! Wesley! We did it! We did it! We won! Wesley! 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 <laughs> the poor lad had died in her arms. Silently. Of exhaustion dehydration a collapse of spirit just like John Henry when he swung his last swing of his great hammer Jeannie's boyfriend Chaz Holdenstead leapt onto the dance floor to comfort her but she remained inconsolable When the prize money was finally doled out and certain complex deductions were made for all sorts of uncertain reasons, Jeannie took home $825. Still a lot of money back then. $50 of that went toward having a photograph of her brother Wesley enlarged, colored, and framed. A portrait that always hung in a prestigious place in her house. That sure is a fine picture of Wesley. When was that taken? That was his high school graduation picture. He looked so serious there. He, he was really a fun guy, you know. I don't have any pictures of him being fun. <laughs> he didn't like having his picture taken. But yes, he was fun. <laughs> and he was sweet. I can't see life being much good without him. I, I, I miss him so. 
I wish it was me who was dancing with you in the marathon instead of Wesley. I blame myself and my two left feet. Wesley was a good dancer, wasn't he? The best. I know this is a very rough time, Jeannie, but I think that there's something that we need to talk about. I'm going to have it. Really? Well, that's just great, honey. Well, that still leaves a question about you and me. Jeannie liked Chaz well enough, but liking him well enough would have to do for now. One wouldn't exactly call Chaz a ne'er-do-well. He was more like an almost-do-well. But all the same, he was quite spectacular at making people believe he was on his way up and out and going someplace special. And she still had $775 left of the prize money. They married a few months later. Her belly bursting from its dress at the ceremony at the town hall. Jeannie, my little honeysuckle, look what came in today's post, will you? What is that? It's from a probate lawyer. My uncle Cedric has passed on. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. Oh, is he the one who... Who owned a funeral parlor in Kentucky? Yes, the very same. So he's left you some money, has he? Well, not exactly. He's left us his property, including this funeral parlor. Oh, well, so what are you going to do? Well, I think we ought to consider taking it over. Oh, uh, oh no. I, I, I don't think I want that. I moved to Kentucky, away from everything I know here in Beulah Bend. Uncle Cedric did very well for himself with that funeral parlor. And imagine it being run by someone like myself, someone with a mind for business. We could open a whole chain of them. Well, but uh, what about our baby? This is the best thing we could do for him. Or her. Just think, Jeannie. This is, this is sure as the possible business to go into. Just think of your basic laws of supply and demand. People never stop dying, you know? Well. It's a business that is failure-proof. Depression proof. Oh, I don't know. Come on. Don't you want to kick the dust from your heels? Beulah Benz? <laughs> Let's go to a real town. Topolonga Terrace, Kentucky. That's a real town right there. They have two of everything. Two movie theaters, two supermarkets, two drugstores. You name it. This here town has one horse and a dead one at that. And it had just one Wesley. Oh, I can't bear it, him not being here anymore. All the reason we should leave and start anew. Wesley. Wesley. Oh, Wesley, he's everywhere I look. In everything I touch. And I can't help it. I, I blame myself. You didn't kill him, Jeannie. That doesn't stop me from feeling this way. Oh, you can't understand. He was all I had in this world. Look, you're about to turn 20. I'm 25. We're not getting any younger, you know. I know. Take my hand. Now listen to me, darling. It would be a sin to turn our backs on such an opportunity. You know that, right? I can't be guilty of a greater sin. Oh, you just don't know. For the last time, Wesley's death is not your fault. I'll spend the rest of my life trying to convince you of it if I have to. And several things did occur from that day on. They took the remainder of the prize money and settled in Topolonga Terrace, Kentucky. The deed to Uncle Cedric's land was transferred, and now they were owners of several acres of unkempt, neglected farmland, in addition to a dilapidated funeral parlor, as well as a modest but sturdy old two-story house adjacent to it. 
And Jeannie gave birth to a little boy. They gave him Jeannie's maiden name as his first name, Ramsey. And her brother's name as his middle name, Wesley. Ramsey Wesley Holmstead. R.W., they called him. Jazz took control of his uncle's old business. He took a correspondence course in mortuary science from Piedmont College. Now, while it didn't prove to be depression-proof, over time it did provide the Holdenstead family with a modest, steady source of income for the family. But as time went on, Jeannie and Chaz began to notice something strange about their little R.W. Jeannie, come look at this. What? What is it? I've been telling you, R.W. is no ordinary little boy. Oh, don't, don't you start that again. He is too. Just an ordinary little boy, just like everyone else. I tell you, he is not. Look at what he can do. Ramsey, show her R.W., old boy. What you learned today from that book I showed you? The vascular system is divided for descriptive purposes into A, the blood vascular system, which comprises the heart and blood vessels for the circulation of the blood, and B, the lymph vascular system, consisting of lymph glands and lymphatic vessels through which the colorless fluid, the lymph, circulates. What did you just make him say there? What, what on earth is this gibberish? That is a direct quote from Grey's Anatomy. What kind of trick is that? I know he's very, very bright, but that's some kind of trained monkey routine that you're doing there, isn't it? It is not, dear. He has not only a photographic memory, but he understands the stuff, too. He knows all about the human body. I taught him myself. Well, I don't like him spending all that time in the funeral parlor with you. Why is a little boy hanging out in such a morbid place all day? I can't stand to go in there myself. You don't understand. It's not a trick, Mother. I understand. He's a genius! He's just five years old! He hasn't even started kindergarten yet. Oh, I'm afraid he's too advanced for kindergarten, Mother. R.W., do me a favor, son, and go back into this parlor and sweep up the chapel. Yes, sir. Jeannie? This boy is a miracle child. Every child is a miracle, Chaz. The boy is smarter than you and I put together. You realize that? Well, he's only five. <sighs> yes, and by the time he's seven, he'll be fully able to run this business without the help of you and me. Oh, come on now. You're not serious. Oh, you are. Oh, God. Oh, <laughs> This is insane, Chaz. I will not let you turn our little son into... into Mother, into... I really do enjoy working with Pa. <laughs> it's a fine job. I can do it well. I'm learning a lot of, every day. Are you even dropping on us, young man? It's just that the good broom is in here. I'm sorry. Please go... <laughs> son, please go back into the parlor like I asked you. Yes, sir. Jeannie tried sending the boy to a small schoolhouse on top of Longa Terrace. Uh, uh, hello? Uh, hello, Mrs. Holdenstead? Oh, hi, yes. My name is Mrs. Glad. I'm your son's grammar school teacher. Oh, well, is everything all right, Mrs. Glad? Why did you come all this way? C come in, come in. I, I was about to have some tea. Uh, that's all right. I, I can't stay long. Oh, all right. Well, what is it, Mrs. Glad? Is there a problem? Well, not quite. Not a bad problem, I would say. You see, your son, Ramsey, is above average. More than above average. Yes, I, I know. I know. He's very bright for his age. Well, not just that, Mrs. Holdenstead. He is very, very advanced for his age. Oh, well, so do we need to let him skip a grade or two? 
Well, there's nothing I can do for him, Mrs. Holmstead. <laughs> what are you saying? He's only seven years old. Academically, he's already performing at the high school level. And with special schooling, he Mrs. could go on... Mrs. Glad, why are you... You're, so, you're trembling. Are you all right? I've never encountered such a thing in my life. He hasn't misbehaved at school, has he? No, never. He's well-behaved. Almost too well-behaved. Forgive me for saying that. Ramsey makes me feel a little nervous is all. Well, if he is well-behaved, then why are you nervous around him? It's about time, you, you know, you, you started making a little sense around here, Mrs. Glad. I don't know. There's something almost otherworldly about him. He's always alone. He has no friends that I can tell. I am completely unable to read him, whether he is content or sad, angry or... He is content. I know that. He's a happy boy. Mrs. Glad, you know, he's happiest at home with us. And he's actually happiest of all when he's at work with his pa. There was something scared, pleading in Mrs. Glad's eyes. So from that day on, there was no more school necessary for R.W. But that's not to say his education did not continue. Chaz's prediction was accurate. R.W. had outgrown his apprenticeship and was indeed the one running the funeral parlor by the time he was seven years old. And for a while, the little family ran happily on its own peculiar rhythms. The Holdenstead Funeral Parlor made the family wealthy as it became known for its lavish and professionally presented wakes and funerals. The people of Topolonga Terrace actually began to see the Holden Seds Parlous funerals as major events. <laughs> Even non-mourners came from miles around to see the boy funeral director who could do it all, from leading the service and prayer to arranging the flowers to embalming the corpses. <laughs> Mr. Holdenstead, my heart is less heavy because of the miracle you performed on my Margaret. I was so sure we were going to have to have a closed casket. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was no trouble, sir. My great pleasure. She was a very lovely woman in life. And I'll be darned if I was going to let a terrible steam shovel incident hinder me from giving Margaret the best possible display. It was a great deal of work, but I am quite proud with the result. And I'm glad that you are as well. There's no one in the world who could have done what you did with Margaret. My work is my joy. <laughs> and I live to serve. Margaret is at play in the fields of our Lord. May God grant her eternal rest and light. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Holinstead. God bless you. And I hear you just turned 10 the other day. A happy birthday to you. Well, thank you, Mr. Shore. The supper time was special in the Holdenstead home. It was the only time of the day when all three could be together. They all gathered in the great dining room where over the table hung a portrait of Uncle Wesley. I declare, R.W., you just look more and more like your Uncle Wesley every day. Isn't that right, Chaz? Look at his little face and then look at that picture. Yeah, a little bit, I suppose. Anything interesting today, R.W.? We had a fellow brought in today, a 15-year-old. He asphyxiated himself with a plastic bag. Ah. A suicide, of course. The plastic bag had propane-butane mixture inside of it. Oh, Oh, my, well, that's horrible. How about we steer the conversation in a different direction for your mother, R.W.? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend. <laughs> Did you tell your mom about the write-up you got in the Topolanga Messenger? Yes. 
I pasted it into the scrapbook with the other articles they've written about me. Oh, nice. Ma. Pa. Yes, dear. I enjoy my work at the funeral parlor, but I wanted to ask you about something. Go on, son. I want to go to college. Maybe Harvard. Yale. Princeton. <laughs> Though I haven't made up my mind which one I want to go to. Oh, well, well, maybe when you're older, son. I have dreams I want to pursue. Remember how unhappy I was when I used to go to school with all those simple-minded children? <laughs> Adults, all of them. And that buffoon of a teacher, Mrs. Glad. I need to be stimulated and challenged or I feel... I feel... You have to think of the family first, R.W. Those are some good dreams to have, but you gotta keep those feet on the ground, too. See, this family, this household, heck, this whole community depends on you and your talents. A lot of men search their whole lives to find a career and a path to go on and so on. And son, let me tell you, you already have it made. You know, I have to agree with your father, R.W. We do need you here. <clears throat> so like the mighty Icarus, I mustn't fly too close to the sun. <laughs> what on earth is an Icarus? I think that's the name of that really tall building in Chicago. Oh. No, Pa. In Greek mythology, Icarus was the son of... Well, in this house, you are the son of me and Ma. End of story. No college, not right now. May I be excused, Pa? I don't want you wandering around all night now. Where do you go at this hour? I collect and arrange specimens for my collages. <laughs> well, collage will be a long way off as long as we're set, you know? No... Collages, as in art collages. Art collage, even worse. <laughs> R.W. began to brood about the house. He read every decent book in the Tapalonga Terrace Library. He took in picture shows at the Tapalonga Terrace Movie House. Nothing seemed to make much of an impression on him anymore. He felt like he was suffocating in desperate boredom and silence. Till one day, an old bearded man with a limp paid him a visit at the office of the funeral parlor. Afternoon, son. Might I be able to sit down with you for a moment? Please have a seat. Oh, why? why, thank you. You don't mind if I take out one of them hog candies you have in that jar there, do you? That's what they're there for, help yourself. Thank you. And you don't mind if I take a little swig of this? This is a funeral home, sir, not a tavern. I'm afraid you can't drink that here. I'm 81 years old. What does it matter? Kentucky bourbon. Still helps me make it through the day. Sir, are you here to inquire about a funeral for a loved one? If you knowed what I knowed, you'd need that stuff too. I didn't always drink, you know. Life can drive a body to it. Life can be hard. Sir, how can I help you? I am quite busy. Are you in need of any of our services? I'm getting up in there in years, I guess. Maybe I can make a reservation with you? I need to get back to work. Good afternoon, sir. Well, wait a moment, son. I've uh, come a long way to see you. Me? A long way. I come all the way from Beulah Bend. Beulah Bend? That's where mother and dad are from. Yep. Chaz and Jeannie. And your Uncle Wesley, too. Well, if you're a relative or a friend, I'll be sure to tell them you paid your visit, mister. I read about you. In the newspapers and even in the Reader's Digest, R.W. Holdenstead, boy mortician. 
If you're looking for money, sir, I'm afraid we don't have any to give, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> ah. Mm. That's no way to talk to your granddaddy, son. Granddaddy? <laughs> Isaiah Rimsey is my name. Mother said you were dead. She wishes that was true. <laughs> Don't half blame her, I suppose. She said that you were mean and cruel and used to beat her and Uncle Wesley without reason or provocation. Like I said, life can be hard, boy, and I've uh, had me a hard one. People that have had hard lives can make other people's lives hard, too, I reckon. What do you want? A lot of money for what I have here in this book. What is that? A diary. Your Uncle Wesley's diary, a vile thing it is. Vile? I haven't read it but once. Couldn't bear to read it again. Yes, this here book could ruin the lot of you holding steads for good. Wait right here. I'll be right back. I ain't going nowhere. Tapalonga Terrace was always a quiet town, but that night it was the quietest it ever been. The air was thin and still, no night birds sang, and the crickets lowered their chirping to an inaudible dog's whistle. The door to the family home creaked open. Mother? Dad? Oh, yes, dear. Oh, where have you been? It's ten o'clock. I need you to come with me. I need to show you something. Well, what's this all about? You heard your mother is late. It's important. It's the most important thing I've ever done. Oh, well, are you all right, honey? You don't look well. Follow me outside. Well, where are you going? Yeah, wait, wait. wait what is this? They followed their son by the light of the moon. They crossed the surrounding meadow, and on their property they suddenly came to an open cave. R.W. clicked on a flashlight. A cave? I didn't realize we have a cave on our property. I discovered it last year. And why didn't you tell us about it? Oh, I swear, sometimes I think you live to make us feel stupid, R.W. Follow me. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. This is where I can take my specimens to make my collages. Diorama is a more precise word. Look at this place. Oh, it must go on forever. I don't believe this. I don't believe it. Uh, oh, uh, oh, 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 my. I like to make displays using some of my favorite specimens from the funeral parlor down here. You can see my recreation of the assassination of President Lincoln. Oh, and this here is just finished. Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. Don't you think that Grandpa Isaiah makes for a good Judas? Now a word from one of our actual sponsors. Enigma Bookstore presents a one-minute mystery starring Johnny Enigma, Private Eye. She spilled it to my office, cool as cucumber and prickly as a bramble bush. Mr. Enigma, I do declare, my name is Wanda. She was a true Southern Belle, all right. Part Scarlet O'Hara, part Blanche Dubois, all crazy. Mr. Mr. Enigma. 
Call me Johnny, doll. Call me Wanda, Johnny. Okay, toots. <laughs> Johnny, you must help me kill this little old... Help me kill something that's been killing my time. I must find out who it is. Or what it is, Flapcakes. Flapcakes? Skip it, sugar pouch. When was the last time you had some time? I'm not sure. I think it was when I was reading the latest George uh, uh, Martin novel. Okay, butter britches. Don't think you can take me for a sap because I know where you get all your pulp at Enigma Bookstore and Astoria Queen. <gasps> But how did you know it was little old me all along? It was easy, Cotton Cuddles. Let's return to the scene of the crime. 3317 Crescent Street, right in the heart of Astoria, Queens. They have all the best in mystery, horror, fantasy, and science fiction. That's where all your time went. Guilty as charged, Johnny. Why don't you meet me at Enigma Bookstore later so you can read me a bedtime story? <laughs> You don't have to ask me twice, honey mittens. Oh, Johnny. And you know you can follow Enigma on Facebook. And on Twitter. Enigma Bookstore. Embrace your inner geek. Bobby Gentry was one of the finest writers of Southern Gothic songs of all time. Here is her most famous song, the powerful and mysterious epic of love and suicide, Ode to Billy Joe, performed by Ms. Martina Da Silva. was the third of June, another sleepy, dusky Delta day. I was out chopping cotton, and my brother was bowling hay. And at dinner time, we stopped and walked back the house to eat. Mama hollered out the back door, y'all remember to wipe your feet. And then she said, I got some news this morning from Choctaw Ridge. Today, Billy Joe McGallister jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge. said to mama as he passed around the black god peace well Billy Joe he never had a lick of sense pass the biscuits please there's five more acres in the lower 40 I've still got to plow and mama said it was a shame about Billy Joe, anyhow. Seems like nothing ever comes to no good up on Chalkdale Ridge. And now Billy Joe McAllister's jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge. Brother said he recollected when he and Tom and Billy Joe they put a frog down my back at the Carroll County Picture Show. And wasn't I talking to him after church last Sunday night? I have another piece of apple pie you know it don't seem so right I saw him at the sawmill yesterday on Choctaw Ridge and now you tell me Billy Joe's jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge and mama said to me 
chat What's happened to your appetite? I've been cooking all morning And you haven't even touched a single bite That nice young preacher, Brother Taylor He dropped by today Said he'd be pleased to have a dinner on Sunday Oh, by the way, he said he saw a girl who looked a lot like you up on Choctaw Ridge, and she said Billy Joe was throwing something off the Tallahatchie Bridge. A year has come and gone. Since we heard the news about old Billy Joe And now, brother married Becky Thompson They bought a store in Tupelo There was a virus going around Papa caught it And he died last spring And now mama doesn't seem to want to do much of anything And me, I spend a lot of time picking flowers up on Choctaw Ridge And drop them into the muddy water of the Tallahatchie Bridge Great Flannery O'Connor once said, I preach there are all kinds of truth, your truth and somebody else's, but behind all of them there is only one truth, and that is that there's no truth. <laughs> This maxim prefigures neatly into tonight's final tale, The Old Stepper. Today is the day that I, Agnes Ellabel Mercy, have died. I am fully aware of this as I leave behind my lifeless, aged body. I can see it beneath me now, lying alone and forgotten on a single-sized mattress covered with a thin green bedspread. The television is on, so is the radio. Oh, President Kennedy is giving an address on civil rights. This is the last thing I ever heard as a living person. I look past my body and around the apartment, the drab apartment I spent my final years. I realize that we cannot choose our endings, but why, why did I have to end this way? To have lived in this ugly, cold, modern tenement so long ago I knew what it was like, was truly like, to live in paradise on the old plantation home and top along a terrace. I'm flying away, away from this sorrowful room and out the window and soaring up into the sky. I'm in another world now so I can go where I please. I know this is now. I know this now that every dream is real. Everything that has ever happened it can be revisited now. The clouds in the sky are orange again. 
The hills are ravishing technicolor green. Even the sad old days, oh, they now seem glorious. There I am. Oh, a girl of seven. Both mama and papa, oh, they've long gone. We have Uncle Ames to run the household. We don't see very much of him, though. Listen, listen to that sound. Can you hear that? It's our nanny, Mother Melinda, rocking in her old rocking chair. She was the roots of our raising, you know. Her steely gray hair pulled back over that leathered and weathered brow. She was as much kin as a negress could be to white folk. How she would frighten us with those old stories of hers. Look, look, it's my sister Portia and me. Oh, just wee little youngins clinging to her dress. Oh, just in absolute terror. There. See, children? Hooey, look at that sun today. Today is gonna be the longest day of the year. The moon will right swallow that old sun, and the sun will turn black as coal. And when that happens, you know what that means, don't you? What is What does that mean, Mother Melinda? Something terrible, I reckon. That means to stay out of the fields on this day and night. For that is when the old stepper comes out to look for a body and a soul to carry away. You mean our field, too? Why, anybody field, child. Heed my warning. And heaven and the Lord help you if you decide to go a-rambling out there this evening. What does the old stepper look like? Well, I don't know. No one knows for sure. No one can say. I only seen his tracks but once. That was enough for me. And I heard him a howling once when I was younger than a both y'all. What does he sound like? Hmm. He sounds like all the pain and damnation of hell. See, it's the old stepper that brings a rain that makes a river flood. It's the old stepper that dries the land so it catches fire. I promise, I I promise not to leave the house at all today. Even if Frank Lester comes calling, I'll just tell him that I can't come out today. Frank Lester! (laughs) Ha 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 ha! Agnes likes Frank Lester! Mother Melinda, you tell her to be quiet. Both y'all, be quiet. Children, behave. Go inside now and do your schoolwork while I make supper. And remember what I told you. To stay out of the fields tonight. That's right. We believed in the old stepper then, but as we grew older, we laughed it off. Laughed at Mother Melinda. We thought we had outgrown her and her old ways. We thought her foolish and senile. But now, now, now I can see. Oh my lord, I can see. I can see now. Look at it. My God. My God, he was always there then, wasn't he? Wasn't it? Look at it. Slither through the wheat and and the barley and the briar. Oh, I, I shudder now to know that story was true, that it was always true. Agnes! You! Agnes! Uncle Ames, I can hear you. Where is your voice coming from? Oh, I can see him now standing so tall with that long mustache. Wearing that long charcoal overcoat. Agnes! Stop talking to that boy and come here right now. There I am, running to the front porch. I don't want to leave your side, Frank Lester, but Uncle Ames is calling. Oh, I'm afraid of him. We don't see him, but maybe once a month. He travels the country on business. When Mother and Father died, he became our custodian since he was our only living relative. He managed Papa's fortune and provided for us when he was a cold. But he was, he was cold. 
It's a cold, man. Agnes, I must talk to you. Yes, Uncle Ames? How many times have I asked you not to associate with Frank Lester? The Lesters are low family, low and common. He, he was just asking me for yesterday's lesson. He was sick, and he could not... Well, uh, keep just... talking to that boy, and you'll both get today's lesson. You are a mercy. That is a name that is greatly respected and carries much responsibility for the bearer of it. It is the, the strength of that name which allows me to carry on the business your father left me. Tarnish that good name, and you will wreck every foreseeable good fortune for every mercy that walks or will ever walk this earth. We don't need Frank Lester or any of those low Lesters poisoning our bloodline. Do I make myself clear? But I could not stop loving Frank Lester. Oh, sweet, sweet Frank Lester. I went to our secret place to meet him in the moonlight. I can still smell the honeysuckle vines. Oh, the honeysuckle vines in the warm southern air. Agnes! Agnes! I've been waiting here forever for you. I had to wait till my uncle was gone. He doesn't want you and I to meet anymore. The Mercies and the Lesters? <laughs> is that what this is all about? Listen, Agnes. We have to convince them somehow that I'm not like them. I'm half ashamed to be a Lester myself. Pa being in jail for fraud and all. That has nothing to do with me and you. You understand? I'm good inside. A man shouldn't be tied up to his surname. Don't you agree? You know I do. I know you're good inside and out. I got this Valentine's present for you. <laughs> but it's June. <laughs> I know that, you little fool. But I couldn't wait that long. Oh, my word. Oh, a locket. Where did you get the money for such a thing? Well, I've been working for my Uncle Terry out in Kenston here and there. I was hoping you'd be wearing the locket when I asked you to dance with me at the cotillion. Uncle Ames won't allow it. You know that. Besides, the cotillion, it won't be for another year. Well, a lot can happen in a year. I just can't do that. Uncle Ames, he frightens me, you see. Well, he doesn't ever whoop you. Why should you be afraid? I would rather he did whoop me. He just makes me... Oh, he, he makes us feel like he could do something so awful whenever he wanted to. Just the meanness in his eyes, it just makes me shrivel up. Oh, yes, sir, I would rather take a switch than be looked at by those eyes. I reckon I can see that, too. He's a frightful sort. But we can't live in fear all our lives. We're going to be 16 next year. <laughs> oh, it's okay to dream, my sweetheart. But, but I must go. Uh, Mother Melinda will be looking for me. Oh, and she's not afraid to use a switch. Okay, sweetheart. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Give me a kiss. Maybe tomorrow. Oh, I just gave you a locket. Oh. You know how long I had to save to buy that for you? Maybe tomorrow, if you're nice. But there you were, Portia, waiting for me on the path on my way home. Uncle Ames told you not to mess about with Frank Lester. It's none of your affair. Why can't you just leave me be and mind what's yours? Our good family name is something that matters to me, Agnes. Please. Please, d d don't go run into Uncle Ames about this. Where did he get that locket he just gave you? Good Lord, were you just spying on us? Well, where did he get that locket? I believe he stole it. Yes, I do. He's too young and foolish to have any other kind of money like that. That is a filthy lie. He saved all of his money to buy it. Those Lesters are all thieves and vagabonds. Oh, you're just repeating what Uncle Ames says. Well, well, he's going to need to know. 
and he will not be happy. I tell you. Please don't tell him. I beg you. As your only sister, I beg you. But she did. She told Uncle Ames. She told him everything. The fairy tale world I once knew. It would soon be gone. Agnes, I ask so little of you. I truly do, but I am left with no alternative. (laughs) Uncle Ames, please, no. I am sending you to Whitman Preparatory School for Girls in Connecticut. You will be enrolled next month. Boarding school? No, no. Uncle Ames, please, please, I I beg you. It's there that you will learn to be a lady and not a burden to me. Or to our family's good name. Well, all of this because of Frank Lester? Yes, because of Frank Lester. But he's, he's just a boy. Just one boy! Don't! You raise your voice at me, young lady. That boy is, as I told you before, common and low. We know all about that locket he gave you. I didn't know it was stolen. I really didn't. Not only was it stolen, he broke into the widow Clark's home to steal it. Damaged her property. Killed some of her chickens as well, as I understand it. The boy is as foul as the river Styx. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. I am sorry, Uncle Ames. I beg you. I've learned my lesson. Oh, no, no. No, it is I who have learned his lesson. I should have nipped this in the bud and sent you away a long time ago. No, I will not make that same same mistake twice. You are a sneak and a deceiver, and I have failed as your guardian to make you a lady, worthy of our society. Now, I suggest you go and pack your things. sent away, sent away to pure misery. Those golden days were ending. I could feel it in my veins as I drank in my last breaths of the old plantation, the plantation home in Topolonga Terrace. While I was away up north, everything changed. During my absence, my sister Portia not only won Frank Lester's affections, she eloped with him and left town for Shreveport, Louisiana. Alienated and deprived of family funds, they soon spiraled into poverty and despair. I never spoke to either one of them again. I returned to Topolonga Terrace when school was finished. I had not been there in over three years. Everything now was in a state of decay and disrepair. I couldn't bear to see it that way. Uncle Ames was ill. He called me to his bedside. Agnes, the doctor's been straight with me. I'm not long for this world. I'm sorry, Uncle Ames. It is I who am sorry, Agnes. I was never much of a guardian to you and your sister. Your sister... (coughs) Your sister... turned out much worse than you did in the end. And I thought she was the one with sense. (laughs) And you are still unmarried, and... you put on some weight, I can see. (coughs) (coughs) No longer the slender bell of the ball you once were. That is a very hurtful thing to say, Uncle Ames. Uh, Not not that it matters any. Uh, When I die, there won't be much fortune to leave you anyhow. (laughs) Not much fortune? What has happened to the family fortune? We Mercers have always been well off. It's... It's gone, Agnes. Those... (coughs) Great days are behind us now. Well, 
Well, what am I going to do? You're going to have to find some kind of work. That's all there is to it. Tears rolled down my face at Uncle Ames's funeral, but not a single one was for him. The house I once knew and loved was nothing but a disfigured, crumbling silhouette against an orange sky. A haunted house that was too desolate even for ghosts to live. Mother Melinda and I, well, we hung on for survival, making ends meet however we could. On one afternoon, on June 21st, 1938. No, no, no. We cannot go out today. Mother Melinda... We have to go out in the field and pick those peas for the market. It would be certain death, child. Please! Oh, no more of this old stepper business. I am not a child anymore. But today is the longest day of the year. It will, I will not follow you. All right. Then I will go out there myself. Please, child. Please don't. Oh, such foolishness. Hadn't there been enough tragedy in this house? Why must we have yet more? Have you not had your fill? I'm going, you silly old fool. Child, there's something you must know. Something I ain't never told you. Something I could never tell you before. But I must tell you now. What? What? What is it? Your mama and pa. All your life we told your sister and you. That they died from the consumption, but they didn't exactly die. What? What What do you mean? Well, they may be dead, but we don't know how or when. See, they just up and disappeared one day, both of them. You say you was just two and Portia was just one year old when they just vanished one day. No one ever figured out what happened to them. Uh, What? For years, everyone suspected it was your uncle that did them in. So as to inherit the family fortune, of course. But that was never to be proved. This this just can't be true. Please, please, I I don't want to hear any more of this. That's what I am saying. No more of this. We cannot cross this field today. We can do it tomorrow. I've never heard anything so crazy in all my life. Go back inside then. Go on, you senile old hag. We need money badly, very badly. I don't care what you say. I'm going out there. Wait, wait. Lord, child, please don't. But I didn't listen. Oh, I did not listen, but I can see now how I wish that I had listened to Mother Melinda. I spent the day, the longest day of the year, picking peas for the market. The sun was eclipsed by the moon. A dry and hot and dusty wind whipped around the fields, For just a shade of a moment, I expected to see the crooked back monster that I imagined the old stepper to look like. But nothing did appear. I went back to my work for a time. But then I saw... I saw... I saw... I saw smoke rising up from the house. And... And and Mother Melinda, her, her words came live... The old stepper that brings the rain that makes the river flood. It's the old stepper that dries the land so it catches fire. Oh, 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 the pain of seeing it again. The great old house being ravished, raped, raped by flames. The sweet smell of the smoke that contained a thousand memories I 
I'm smelling it now. And I'm floating, floating over the fields and sailing into the great burning house to see, to see for myself. I'm flying past the porch and I bump against the great columns and I glide through the front window into the kitchen. Oh, there's Mother Melinda lying dead in her old rocking chair. Oh, poor, poor Mother Melinda. She had a heart attack and her pipe fell from her hand to the floor. The burning pipe. Just as the newspapers would explain as the cause of the fire. It's the old stepper that dries the land so it catches fire. And my, my spirit, my spirit is intertwining with the smoke. I can see even more in the smoke. Oh, a thousand memories are in that smoke. Revelations. I can see Frank Lester. Oh, young Frank Lester, hiding in the yellow, tall grass, that yellow grass. Oh, he's pulling his slingshot, killing a beautiful swan, and then one by one, picking off its ducklings. Then I, I see the glass shatter, his lithe body climbing into the widow's house and ransacking the place, smashing everything, turning everything over until he finds it, finds it shining in the sunlight, glowing bright beyond belief, that heart-shaped locket. Yo, mama and pa. Revelations, revelations. Oh, I can't bear it. I'm flying up the chimney and back up into the sky. And I plunge downward, downward until I am floating over the river. They just disappear. And who says the dead are better off? Your mama and papa. I can see clear to the bottom of the river without having to sink into it. Two wooden boxes. Two wooden boxes weighted with stones. Their skeletal remains. A mother and father I never knew. For years, everybody suspected it was. Uncle Ames! Uncle Ames! Uncle Ames, you did this! The old stepper. Uncle Ames! The old stepper. Uncle Ames! The old stepper. Uncle Ames! The old stepper. Uncle Ames. The old the old stepper. stepper.
That was the haunting old lullaby, Kentucky Babe, sung by the fabulous Ms. Allison Gwynn and the fabulous Ms. Martina De Silva. <laughs> and before we part for this evening, I wanted to read this for you. It comes from the great William Faulkner's 1949 Nobel Prize acceptance speech. I decline to accept the end of man. It is easy enough to say that man is immortal simply because he will endure that when the last ding-dong of doom has clanged and faded from the last worthless rock hanging tideless in the last red and dying evening, that even then there will still be one more sound, that of his puny, inexhaustible voice, still talking. I refuse to accept this. I believe that man will not merely endure he will prevail he is immortal not because he alone among creatures has an exhaustible voice but because he has a soul a spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance the poets the writers Duty is to write about these things. It is his privilege to help man endure by lifting his heart, by reminding him of the courage and honor and hope and pride and compassion and pity and sacrifice which have been the glory of his past. The poet's voice need not merely be the record of man. It can be one of the props, the pillars to help him endure and prevail. Thank you, Mr. Faulkner. Well, that is quite a note to end the night on. Here's to the great men and... Well, wait a second. Here's to the great men and women of American Southern literature that helped inspire us this evening. Cheers. We do hope that you enjoyed tonight's program. Let's have a big all hand for our wonderful cast. Ms. Allison Gwynn. Mr. Daniel Graves. Ms. Stephanie McElroy. Mr. Michael Pate. Mr. Eric Davy Gislason. Ms. Martina De Silva. Our fabulous musical score has been performed and improvised by the fabulous Mr. Steve Blanco. Our amazing sound effects engineer is Mr. Greg Russ. This show was written for you by Mr. Sylvan Sandovar. And produced by myself and Mr. Gustavo Rodriguez. Such special thanks to the fabulous and beautiful staff of the Slipper Room. Treat them well, people. Treat them well. 
For all things Fireside, be sure to sign our mailing list, follow us on the Facebooks and the Twitters, and, and we'll be announcing a new podcast very soon. So y'all, we will be on hiatus this summer, but we will return for a new season of thrills and excitement this fall. Stay tuned for more details. Now, now, my darlings, oh, I've dragged this on, haven't I? Now, my darlings, take in that last sweet honeysuckle-scented breeze and have one more bourbon for the road. But by all means, on your way home this evening, please do mind the shadows. Another round of applause for Ms. Ali Silva. Thank you. Yeah.